I would like to officially call this TAC meeting to order at 10, 11.06 a.m. Um, and welcome everybody, not only here in New York City, but also in Albany. Uh, we should have a quorum today. Uh, so what I'd like to do is start with some attendance. Right. Hearing. So are you guys hearing us, Jamin? Yes. Okay. 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 So on the TAC, why don't, Gavin, why don't you start on that end and we'll work this way. Sure. Morning, Gavin Landry, Empire State Development, Division of Tourism. Rich Newman, uh, State Marketing Strategy, ESD. Nancy Elder, new to the team from JetBlue. Hi, I'm Ross Levi, Vice President of Marketing Initiatives at Empire State Development. Hi, hey guys, it's Tom Mulroy. All right, Tom. Tom. I get Tom's on the phone, right? Good morning, yeah, everyone. Yeah. I'm Kenneth Adams, President and CEO of ESD. And Dan Fuller from Bristol Mountain and TAC member. <laughs> John Harris, TAC member. Good morning, John Percy, representing New York State Destination Marketing Organizations. Pete Carr, final PAC Business Marketing Consultants. Eleanor Tatum, publisher of the Amsterdam News. I'm Michael Johnson, Cornell School of Hotel Administration. I'm Lizette Montero, head of events for ESD. Lisa Soto, program associate of tourism at ESD. Erin, you want to start on the back? Sure. Mark Nicholson, I love New York. I'm going to lay for OCG, which is my company. I've done a lot of consulting work in New York and just moved to Manhattan. He's not coming. In perfect timing, Assemblywoman, would you like to? <laughs> Assemblywoman Marge Markey, uh, Chair of the Tourism, Sports, Arts Committee, the State Assembly. And we're so honored that you've joined us today. Thank, Thank you. The you. rain kept me a little late. Sorry about that. No, no problem. We're just getting started. And I, I know Tom is on the line. I heard somebody else join us by phone. Hey, up here. Yeah, Chris. I'll be in. Uh, I'm just in the traffic uh, midtown. I'll be there in about 10 minutes. Basically. But I'll be on the phone until then. Okay. And Christine, did you hear? I'm Gail here too. Okay, great. Gail, Gail Grimmett from Delta. And let's send it over to Albany. Jamin, who do you have there? Jan, go ahead and start. This is Jan Chesterton, the New York State Hospitality and Tourism Association TAC member. Jill Delaney, New York State Tourism Industry Association. Phyllis Shabielski, ESD's Public Affairs Office. Jamin Clemente with I Love New York. Pat Hooker with the Executive Chamber, Handle Food and Agriculture. Rosemary Ladigano from Assemblywoman Markey's office. And that's it for us. We also have Sage and Patrick, yeah, who Sage, are terrific. Uh, uh, international marketing uh, and web marketing, yes, Great. So thank you. See, they can't see you over there. You're strategically They're hiding. They're the hiding. Back ventures. Uh, okay, there's also a sign-in sheet that will probably make its way to you, so we have your contact information. Um, there is also at your uh, desk is a copy of the minutes. They were sent earlier, so if, if there are no changes, I'd like to uh, get a motion to approve the minutes. I'll move it. So move John Ernst and second. second. Okay. Michael Johnson seconded. Very good. Um, we will hold off on the vote for the subcommittees, at least until you tell me, because Tom's on his way. Tom, Tom and, and Alana. Has to and Alana, well. okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to move ahead because we're very um, fortunate to have Ken Adams join us today. I know with your busy schedule and traveling around the state, it's always, it's always uh, great to see you, Ken. So if you could give us a wonderful update on things that you've been doing. Um, well, well, well uh, just very quickly because you have a full agenda, Christine, but as I've said at um, other meetings earlier in the year, uh, there's so much going on and the kind of coordinating body that keeps track of all of this and gets really valuable uh, industry input uh, wouldn't work were it not for Christine Nicholas and her great leadership. So again, thank you, Christine. And uh, it, there's a lot of time and energy behind the scenes this, and, uh, that goes into this as well. And Christine is always there for us, so we really appreciate that. You know, the governor appreciates that. Well, very quickly, and I'm sorry I wasn't able to make the September meeting in Albany, but as Christine points out, I've sort of have been, as the nature of my you know fuller job at ESD, on the road with a lot of things all over the state. 
Uh, but I do want to just mention quickly a couple things related to either items on today's agenda or other tourism-related initiatives that I've been involved in on behalf of the governor. And that's just by way of, since these meetings are, are a good forum for updates, it's good for me to do that. Later in the agenda, Gavin is going to talk about the CFA process in Market New York and the awards for tourism that go out through the regional council system. The only thing I'll say, which I'm sure Gavin by now knows, is that on Friday, the governor's office announced that the date for that will be December 10th, right, Gavin? Yeah. So many of you uh, know of applicants or have lots of people saying, hey, when are the announcements going to be made? And December 10th is now the date uh, for the Regional Council Award Ceremony. Uh, I assume up in Albany, Gavin. It is. But I just, for folks to mark their calendar, because we have been, people have been asking about that. Um, the, um, you know, I, I just wanted to quickly mention two two tourism-related events that I took part in uh, to myself on behalf of the governor the last couple of well, since our last meeting. One was Scott Brandy had invited me to his annual meeting of the Ski Association of New York, where I saw Dan and many others, a great event, up at Hunter Mountain on September 23rd. Um, and um, it's that's the New York Ski Expo. I hadn't been before. It was great to go. Scott was a terrific host. And, uh, you know, he said, oh, you know, you can come up to this thing, Commissioner, be there for 20 minutes, say a few words and leave. Well, that was a lie. Uh, <laughs> you know, he had me meeting everybody there. And it was great. And it was great to have a better understanding from an economic development point of view of what I would call the ski industry supply chain. All of the many businesses from the state, from the region, actually global companies that were there with their very, in the trade show, for example, that all tie into the ski industry uh, and add jobs and capital spending uh, all across the state. It was great. And uh, I'd be happy to go if Scott is nice enough to invite me to go back again next year. But, but again, there for all of you and with everybody kind of showing the state support to the New York ski industry at the Expo in September. You know, just uh, more recently on October 30th, so just a couple of weeks ago, I went to Corning uh, for the official, kind of a big, a big media event at the Corning Museum of Glass for the opening uh, or the celebration of the International Motor Coach Receiving Facility uh, that they've built uh, with some, some amount of state support. Uh, and that, as everybody knows, the Corning Museum of Glass is such an important destination for international visitors, and in particular visitors, here's Markley from China, uh, and they now, of course, have all their marketing materials in Mandarin Cantonese, they have bilingual staff people at the museum, uh, and they really are doing very, very well uh, at attracting international visitors. We use the Corning Museum of Glass story a lot to talk about upstate institutions that have really figured out how to market themselves to international tourists, in this case especially tourists from Asia, a very big and important market to be sure. So that was a terrific event and it was very, I was proud and, and pleased to be a part of it on behalf of the governor back in late October. Um, I see our friend Pat is on, is going to be Pat Hooker, uh, the Deputy Secretary for Agriculture, is going to be part of our agenda today for Taste New York and other things. Uh, know that working together with Pat, a group of us here, here at ESD, remain focused on state fair and are working uh, on a series of recommendations. Ross is to, uh, a key player in this. Uh, a series of recommendations just to continue to drive improvements in state fair from the this, this sort of the infrastructure of the fairgrounds to the marketing of it, to the attractions, the events, the, all the important uh, features of the event uh, every year. So we're work we've got, like I say, work group <coughs> here working with Pat and his team and the team from Ag and Markets uh, and, of course, the team at uh, Salina at, at Syracuse that works on the fair uh, because we really see tremendous potential for New York State Fair and, frankly, tremendous potential from the standpoint of increased economic development, jobs, and attractions in the wonderful month of August in uh, central New York. So lots of work on that going on right now. Um, and I think, you know, Christine, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I would say that as those two examples of uh, the New York of, of the, the Ski Association event with Scott Brandy and Corning Museum of Glass. If any of you <coughs> on the council are, are working on events where you think it would be helpful for me to go, to listen, to deliver remarks on behalf of the state, to show our support, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to Christine or to me um, and to see if we can do that because I do like to help shine a spotlight on tourism events, attractions, and opportunities, you know, all across the state. It's one of the simple and few things I can do here uh, in my role on the council, again, is to sort of 
be helpful as an advocate uh, and to hopefully again um, shine a spotlight on our great our great attributes and our great attractions as a state. You know, with uh, Dan to my right, the only thing I'll say is while it may be rainy, uh, <laughs> Assemblyman, you mentioned the rain here in New York. It's supposed to snow big time <laughs> in the next couple of days in western New York. And I think everybody knows the very good news from the North Country that on Friday, uh, the governor announced the opening of the Orta facilities, notably Whiteface Mountain and Gore Mountain opened up uh, for skiing this past weekend in the North Country. So no doubt... Bristol uh, and a host of other places. I don't know what's good. Someone else will have to tell us what's going on uh, in the Catskills, but in western New York, a Holiday Valley, Bristol, and other places, they should yep. get a huge amount of snow. <laughs> and uh, that is just great for an early and sort of loud and exciting start to this winter ski season. So congratulations on the weather. So thank you, Christine. <laughs> thank you, Christine. Thank you, Kenneth, and, and uh, thank you for your... A very generous offer to be there when we need you um, to help really shine that tourism spotlight because you really have had an open door and also just really have been so supportive. Um, and we wish you lots of snow, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of snow, I think uh, that is why our co-chair Thurman, are you on the phone yet? Well, Thurman Thomas came in. I thought I heard him come in, but. He snowed in already, right? Yeah. In said. Buffalo. Okay. So, alrighty. Um, I wanted to give you an update on TAC uh, as far as our, um, our membership. We have a vacancy update, and at the end of our last meeting, I received a letter of resignation from longtime TAC member John Segendorf. Um, John feels that it's time for him to retire from the hospitality uh, career, which I don't believe at all. I think <laughs> we will end up seeing him somewhere. But he wants to focus on his personal life, and we really do thank him for the dedication that he has given to the hospitality industry. I think it spans over 50 years or so. So uh, I, I said that uh, on behalf of TAC, we would thank him today. And also, um, that's left us with four vacancies. So as you probably recall, TAC is 18 members. We have four vacancies, or that left us with four vacancies. Um, but fortunately, today we are welcoming a new member who has just been appointed by the Senate Majority Leader, Dean Skelos, and that is Nancy Elder. So welcome, Nancy. Uh, Nancy is the Vice President of Corporate Communications for JetBlue Airways. And before her current role, she was the founding partner and chief strategy officer at Matter Unlimited, a strategic and creative communications agency, and also held positions at General Electric, MasterCard, Marsh, and Time Warner. Terrific New York companies there. Uh, Nancy, we're very excited to welcome you to TAC. Thank you so much. Looking forward to it. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm new to the aviation industry, um, just having joined JetBlue over the summer, but learning fast and furiously. Uh, and as you mentioned kindly, Christine, thank you. I come from a long line of New York-based companies, so I'm very proud to be representing New York's hometown airline here. It seems like a very apt uh, evolution for me. So I really appreciate that, and I'm very much looking forward to participating with everyone here. Well, thank you. I'm sure we can gain insight from you from your communications background as well. That always comes in handy. Right, Ellie? It seems to. Um, we have a couple of folks that joined um, that I just wanted to make sure we introduced. I saw George and Tim from Marriott. Hi, George. Hi. Welcome. Um, George oversees the Marriott Marquis, which is like the biggest hotel um, in the Times Square area. We're very happy that you could join us. Um, Morris Silver has joined yes. us. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm sorry we're late. We That's got fine. Fucking traffic. It's un unbelievable. Thank you. And Melanie, thank you. Of course. Um, a lot. Where's Alana? Oh, Alana. <laughs> Thank you. Traffic Our Alana. Alana from Long Island. We appreciate you being here. Did I miss anybody else? Okay. All right. So um, I think what we'll do is hold off until Tom gets here to take that vote on the subcommittees. Um, and now I'm going to hand it over to Pat Hooker from the Deputy Secretary for Food and Agriculture who um, heads up Taste New York. So, Pat, welcome. We look forward to your report. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Christine. Can everyone see the presentation before we get going? Yep. Yes, yes. Jamin. Okay. Looks good. Yeah. Always a pleasure, Commissioner. Nice to see you, Pat. 
Oh, wow, we're going to multitask here. So this is uh, excellent. So thank you very much, Christine, for the invitation. Uh, it's been uh, very, very rewarding for us to work on um, the Taste New York initiative that the governor put forward a couple of years ago, and it's emblematic, really, of all the things we're doing, which is working across agencies. Uh, so believe it or not, uh, the Taste New York initiative, although, you know, the the two leads are certainly Empire State Development, um, working with uh, tourism, with the I Love New York team, and the Department of Agriculture and Markets, because it obviously is very much that intersection. Having said that, Office of General Services, uh, Department of Transportation, uh, Department of uh, 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 the Thruway Authority, all are involved in various facets of it. So because it is events, it is retail locations, uh, now vending machines with just New York product in it and promotional programs. So uh, to, re to recap 14, uh, we've had 65 events so far this year since January 1st. Uh, the direct sales at those events were $200,000 and much more to the point. They were intended to be um, a brand exposure for the uh, the whole Taste New York initiative and for these companies. Uh, and so we've had nearly 300 of those companies come in. But most importantly, I think the best number on that slide is 1.5 million, excuse me, 5.9 million people were exposed to those uh, taste events. So activations at the Super Bowl, um, uh, the State Fair, all, uh, a variety of, of locations around the state. Manhattan Cocktail Classic was a big one uh, last spring. Belmont. Bike New York Beer Garden. Commissioner, you may have been there. Huh? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so with regard to uh, retail locations, uh, there are eight uh, different retail stores that we have open. Along the New York State Thruway, there is one at the Chittenango Rest Area, uh, the New Baltimore uh, Rest Area, which was actually the first one that we did. Taste stores at uh, LaGuardia, JFK, uh, MacArthur. Uh, a brand new one we opened actually the same day as the Global Summit at the Javits Center. Uh, and then um, uh, along state highways, and this is an interesting conundrum for us, actually, although certainly positive for the, uh, and with, with good intentions, you can't have uh, stores on most highways. Most stores, uh, the Federal Highway Act, uh, you know, wanted to preserve the exits for the private businesses that exist. And so we're very limited in our ability to deploy something on a, on a highway, but we do have the Todd Hill Market along the Taconic Parkway, which uh, pre-existed that law, and very exciting, a brand new store at uh, Grand Central Station. Um, so and we also have uh, Taste Farmers Markets located at uh, 16 Thruway Plazas, and all of those stores ge generated about $700,000 in income since uh, January of 14, uh, and a very nice uh, partnership, and I failed to mention them actually at the beginning, it was um, the MTA and the beverage carts. Uh, there as you enter the train. So exposure, although not a, a tourism-related uh, uh, item, very nice sales opportunity to uh, to sell craft beverages, local wines, and so on to people uh, getting on the trains in the evening instead of just the, the, the normal run-of-the-mill products that are typically uh, available. There is a nice uh, shot of Todd Hill, and that is actually one of the farmers markets uh, that we have in the uh, in the good weather later in the summer um, but complete redo great interagency cooperation here with, with that uh, another scene of it there uh, that well excuse me that's at the thruway and then the and then the LaGuardia store the new store at the Javits uh, the, the slide on the right Grand Central that's that new store and so we decided to bring in Gavin's evil uncle here and tell you that the total <laughs> impact was uh, $1.5 million in uh, 2014. Great deal of thanks uh, to our friends and partners here at I Love New York. Uh, a lot of terrific advice. Um, and, and, and Kenneth, thank you in advance for the work you're doing with the State Fair. It's been very fun uh, discussing uh, those ideas. 
I think there's an awful lot more, and the governor certainly wants to bring that the showcase of that um, to a lot more people in the state, even though you know a million people went through the fair last year. So where we're headed in 2015 is to triple the gross sales of 4.5 million. We, we like to think big. Events, retail, vending, um, Taste New York website, as with a lot of marketing, and, and, and probably Rich will touch on this, we're a part of all of the consolidation of marketing that's out there. Big boost into uh, SUNY and CUNY schools, expanding offerings of uh, local products to all 27 throughway plazas, uh, and DOT will open at least two new stores. So we're going to continue to roll those out. Again, a great interagency uh, partnership on that effort. Uh, vending machines is, is a great way around the fact that you can't have stores everywhere, and they're not necessarily appropriate everywhere. So working with uh, a vending machine association um, to deploy those, mostly through DOT facilities for now. <coughs> great partnership with the uh, liquor stores around the state, point-of-sale programs, all kinds of things to identify local products. You start to see taste as part tourism as it relates to visits and just part sales and, and, and brand awareness. Uh, worked with Rich on this next bullet, um, uh, highlighting taste stops on mo mobile phone applications similar to what you might do with Path Through History or something like that. And then, of course, following up on the Governor's uh, Global Summit, a, a lot of focus this coming year will be also to see how much more of these products that we can export. New York is a very fascinating and interesting agricultural state in that you know, we have produced for the wonderful uh, ethnic, religious, uh, and religious markets, various cultural markets that we have in this state really like no other state. And so we have a lot of producers oriented to um, uh, producing products people are used to in their heritage or their home. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot of opportunity, I think, for us to turn that around and, and, and sell. Uh, we have been uh, talking with a brand retail consultant a little bit uh, about, you know, what, where do we go with, with the program uh, going forward. Uh, so creating a, a brand marketing plan, developing sort of standard templates for retail displays, pop-up markets, stores, etc. So that is a, uh, a quick summary of, of where we are. We are rolling out the governor as part of um, Beer, Wine, Spirits Summit that we did last spring also rolled out uh, $3 million in two separate uh, uh, offerings. One will be a matching grant program. And the other, though, will focus on um, tourism. And so it's a million dollars focused on the craft beverage uh, industry to see what do, what do these... Um, really focus on the associations. How do they move this thing forward? How do you move uh, our s small but very rapidly growing distilling businesses, craft beer businesses? Of course, wine is more developed here in the state. And then brand new, really, on the scene in the last couple of years has been hard cider. So very exciting uh, to work on all of that. And that, I think, wraps it up. Um, thanks, Pat. I, d I just had a follow-up question, um, and then I'd like to open it up to anyone else, but the governor's announcement, the press release that was just sent out, and I, I uh, would just like a little bit more clarity on how this million dollars through the associations, how you envision that that is going, is that more of a marketing tool? Is it um, where people have, if, I don't know if it's not-for-profits yeah, or associations? Right. So the, that is the only eligible entities, and that program will be run entirely through the staff at ESD, and uh, more importantly, and uh, fortunately for all of us, through the hands of uh, Sam Filler, who heads up the governor's one-stop shop uh, for the craft beverage industry. And he is working uh, and will be partnering on the one million side uh, with the um, I Love New York team here. And then on the $2 million matching grant, which can be a, a whole variety of, of things, the, the, uh, that will be more a partnership with the Ag and Market side. So um, eligible entities for both grants are nonprofit uh, corporations. And um, the, uh, I, it is important to note that what we're trying to do is, is get some really new ideas put forward, new ways to market all these craft beverages. 
And so in talking to Sam, he wanted me to remind uh, everyone that organizations currently receiving tourism matching funds and or having an active grant under the Market New York Tourism Initiative are not eligible to apply for direct funding, but may be considered as partners with uh, on a program application with some other nonprofit. Could be like a wine trail or somebody like that. Uh, additionally, projects that are already being funded by, uh, you know, other another New York State funded program are not eligible, uh, which specifically includes craft beverage industry marketing and promotion grant. We've had we have some other uh, grant avenues for those people. So only new projects or initiatives <coughs> by applicants uh, and and project partners are eligible. So this is really designed not to be, you know. A, 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 a circular effort, but really a new one. Hmm. Okay. Anybody have any questions? So, so Pat, just um, for as far as the not for profits are concerned, do they have to be in the food and beverage industry, or is it something like if there was a, a, a march or a um, you know, say the AIDS Walk, for example, which is a established not-for-profit, and they want to showcase Tate New York. Is that the type of thing that you're envisioning, right. where you know, 50,000 people, so they can see it, they can sample? I don't know. You know, I don't know what the rules are as far as sampling outside, but is that what you're envisioning? Sure. You know, the, and and the idea was that you know, even though this is a generous amount of money, I mean. You know, if this were to go into corporate advertising, it would be sort of one hit. And so the idea is to go to associations, go to uh, uh, not-for-profit groups, completely imagining uh, partnering with, uh, with, you know, local tourism organizations or whatever. Um, pretty broad, pretty broad opening there. And uh, actually, there's going to be a webinar. I think I have, yes, there'll be a webinar to go through the whole thing on the 4th of December and another one on the 5th of December. And so, you know, any questions anybody has, any interested organizations uh, sh should plan to participate there. And I would encourage anyone to reach out directly to Sam uh, at the one-stop shop who's um, in charge of the project. Great. So maybe, Lisa, what we can do is make sure that TAC calls into the webinar, and then you can just do a summary. Um, right. Because I are pretty busy, so that would be helpful. It, it, okay. It, it was, you know, it, it was important, too, to all of us just to say, and I, I think that's right, please do call in because the idea is to advance the craft beverage industry, you know, not necessarily just a region. So, the, it's, you know, tourism professionals are going to bring an enormous amount to the table here, but we wanted it to be sort of led by what the beverage people see as effective and then to bring everybody together. Great. Well, thank you, Pat. Appreciate the report. Sure. And um, and now it, uh, I'd like to introduce Richard Martin. Uh, I'm sorry, Richard sure. Newman. I don't know why I said that. Executive Vice President for State Marketing um, and Strategy at ESD. So you'll give us an update on, on marketing, Rich? Uh, yes. Thanks, thank Christine. And, and thank you, Pat. Um, what I thought would be helpful is I think everyone is aware at the last tourism summit, the governor committed to support tourism to the tune of $45 million this year. And um, we all know that's a significant amount of money. What we have been working towards is ensuring that the way that we're spending that money actually has a significant positive return for the state and for the people of the state. So what I was hoping to share were some of the efforts in terms of results of not only all of the people on our team who are actually developing initiatives and programs, but um, uh, as well all of the multiple agencies, including Ag and Markets and Department of Tourism, Department of Transportation, et cetera, with whom we collaborate and with whom we develop a lot of these programs. And while I didn't um, want to touch upon everything and go through a long list, I thought it would be worthwhile to talk about four or five of the key areas where we invest money and some of the returns that we're getting on them. First and foremost, I think that everybody is aware of the 
fact that um, advertising is a pretty significant part of what we do, television advertising. And the objective of our TV advertising is primarily to drive visits to our website to make sure that people have all of the information about all of the variety of state of trackers that are there, as well as to enhance positive perceptions of New York State. So the one of the initiatives this year, led by GAM, and Anna Packman has also been key to this, is to enhance our website experience, and I think you're all familiar with that. The website actually has generated, the new website, significantly in, a significant increase in positive user experience. So we have not only more people visiting the, the site, but the number of pages they visit per session has increased, and the bounce rate, meaning the number of people who stay on the site, who don't leave after coming to the first page, has decreased by 28%. And what, what that means is that we are creating a better experience for people to explore New York and all the great things there are to do in New York. So kudos to all of the people who worked on that. Um, the advertising itself, the broadcast advertising, is a critical component in driving people to that website. Over the past year, we've had a 10.5% increase in visitors, which is quite significant considering the absolute number of visitors we already get. More importantly, what we have seen is in those periods when we run advertising, we have a 48 to 62 percent increase in visitors during that time frame versus the times when we don't run the advertising. <laughs> so tourism obviously generates a lot of web visits because it's an interest for many people on an average <coughs> basis, but clearly the advertising is helping us de develop a visitation strategy to our site. The second component of them is the perceptions of New York State. And we um, conduct a series of tracking studies to understand where we stand relative to other markets. Um, and what we have found is that um, in the most recent study <coughs> around summer tourism is that 70% of New York State residents, and of course New York State residents are our lion's share of actual tourists, um, believe New York is a great summer destination. 40% of out-of-state residents believe that it is a great summer destination. That is the highest of any of the states that we consider competitive markets, which are basically states within a five-hour um, driving range. 78% believe that they will consider New York State as a destination in the future. 64% currently will do that, which is a very significant amount of people. Um, what we are also clear about is that we are very strong in terms of four key criteria. One is New York State is a great escape. There's an enormous number and variety of activities. It's great value for the money and the range of activities is pretty significant. That is really important to us because no other state in the world has the incredible array of things to do here, and that's both a blessing, but it's also a little bit of a curse because we have to convey all of this to people. And so we're, we're very happy that we're beginning to actually do that. Perhaps most importantly, we also track featured destinations in the advertising. So when we show the beaches of Long Island or when we show the Baseball Hall of Fame, do we actually increase visitation to that? We know that overall we are driving a 3 to 4% increase in <coughs> visitors for this state. But these destinations that are featured in the advertising get up to a 45 or 55% increase in visitors. On average, we are getting about 15% increase in visitors year over year for those destinations we're featuring. <coughs> Part of the reason why we try to feature these great destinations that are also symbolic of the world-class attractions that the state owns. So we feel as if we're getting a very positive response in terms of the advertising, as well as in terms of the investment in digital activities. Events is another critical component in what it is that we have been doing. And again, our objective in events is to take a captive audience. We attend events with attendees of three to 300,000 visitors. And what we want to do is make them aware of other things there are to do in New York State and to drive increased consideration. And what, what has become clear is that over the 50 events that we actually attended this year, that was a lot of work, 
Harper, Lizette, and Patrick, and Sage, and Lisa, and Jamin, and all the whole team, and, and Kenneth Adams, and no, Ken Wong. Ken Wong, Ken Wong, Ken Wong. <laughs> exactly. Well, Kenneth Adams, too. I know you were there. <laughs> um, and what, what we have found is that about 67% of visitors to this event will consider actually making another trip to a New York State destination. And based upon some preliminary modeling we have done, we expect that there's about a 1.2 payout for these events. Moving forward, we're going to focus on some of the larger events and increasing the number of brand ambassadors at these events because clearly the face-to-face -face communication and the passion that our people have for telling the story of what's great in New York has a very strong correlation with that increased interest in visiting New York. So we feel very positively about this very large expansion of event activity that we've undertaken this year for New York State as well. And then um, finally, from an international standpoint, um, Mark Lee and Gavin, I know we're going to talk about uh, World Travel Mart, but we've also seen a lot of success in the money that we've begun to invest in international travel, which used to be a greater focus, and we're now starting to bring that back in with the governor's leadership on global as an important initiative for the state. And what we are beginning to see is real nuts and bolts success in terms of getting tour operators to come to the state from out of the country to actually put New York State on their agenda and uh, we, we expect that there's going to be a lot of success that attends to that as well. So this just covers a little bit of the work we're doing. It doesn't even begin to get into the public <coughs> relations work that M. Silver has been so um, helpful in leading. But uh, And there are lots of other areas, Taste New York, et cetera, where um, there are equal success stories. But overall, where we are investing the lion's share of the money, we are quite confident that we are getting a positive return on that investment and that we're setting up tourism for New York at long term as a continued successful economic development area. So that's really all I wanted to share. That's a terrific report. Sounds like a wonderful ROI. That's what it's all about. Any questions in particular about the advertising marketing? I would just like to compliment the governor and, and the executive leadership that we've had the last couple of years. It's just been phenomenal to see the you know focus being put on tourism, but um, the results. You know, we have to get better at giving you some results for the destinations that are featured. They are seeing results, and, and we've got to you know have that correlation and the energy between um, our departments or our you know, respective agencies and your agency. Um, so that you have that information firsthand from the destination. So I'll make sure this information gets passed over and we start getting that information, feeding it to you. Gavin's asked, um, and, and we'll make sure that does happen. Great. So, that would be very helpful. Thank, but thank you. Thanks, John. Yeah, um, I was wondering what kind of focus there has been on getting non-traditional communities to, say, get focused on for skiing. For instance, black community for skiing, right. and then also in upstate communities, getting them to come down to New York City. So, what right. kind of local advertising and local efforts are being done? Well, uh, that's a, uh, a a great question. Our our focus is bilateral, if you will, in the sense that we are focused both on upstate tourists and making them aware of all of the things in the rest of the state, <coughs> including New York City. And you may or may not uh, notice that because it's a bit subtle, but for us it's kind of a big deal. We started to include a lot of New York City destinations in the general marketing we do, which runs across the state. Similarly, obviously, we're trying to get the New York <coughs> metropolitan area residents um, aware of the fact that New York State is not the wilderness that they think it is, but it is filled with all kinds of wonderful things. Um, the, the issue in terms of um, specific communities we continue to work towards making sure that we are driving awareness and visibility of a number of different programs, um, but it's also a, 
um, an initiative that we work with the local um, tourism advisory councils that uh, needs to happen there as well. In another way, Richard, if I can just jump in, Christine, because Eleanor's point is really important. The 10 regional councils that we have across the state uh, are very helpful as well because when they all have uh, pretty diverse representation cutting across stakeholders in a region. So they're very good at identifying, at least locally, attractions and things they want to put on the map. What we haven't done enough of, and your question in that regard is helpful, is is go to them also and say, okay, so you know, how do we connect you to other activities in other parts of the state, right? But I get, point, my point is that we can use the Regional Council's Ridge as well to get at Eleanor's challenge, which is really, really important. Well, I'll just share with you anecdotally a little thing that happened just this week, uh, or la last week, today's Monday. Um, and it's a shame Pat left, but just to show you how we, you know, as a TAC, and instead of, you know, in the past, I think, um, you know, the, the government used to operate in silos, and now I think we've come together much, much better. So <coughs> Lincoln Square is a community on the Upper West Side here, and they have a Christmas tree lighting every year, all right? So, and uh, Ken Wong, you know, we, we were letting Ken Wong know about it, and he just asked, where do they get their tree from? I have no idea. So I found out North Carolina, Canada, you know, everywhere but New York. They have never had a New York tree, and this has been a, a oops, huge... Oops. Yeah, and it's been going on for 15 years, and WABC does this live. So there's a press component, there's a marketing component, so we got in touch with a gentleman named Ned Chapman who does the PR or the marketing for the Christmas tree growers, and we got that through Pat. So Pat put this together, and next thing you know, they um, get them a tree, which cost, you know, they pay for it, but it cost half of what they were paying in Canada, you know, so of course that made the bid happy. And when we announced to the press that this local tree, you know, New York grown tree, like a tree grows in Brooklyn type of thing, but this was a tree grows in New York, they had three television crews show up for the tree chopping, <laughs> six newspapers, and this little tree, it's only 25 feet, unlike, like, unlike Rockefeller Center, which is 75 or whatever feet, but um, that tree, by the way, came from Pennsylvania, had nothing to do with that tree. <laughs> Next year, though, I think they're going to be looking at it because, so they got all this press for this, for this tree, and then I just understand that Mayor de Blasio's wife has said, all the trees at Gracie Mansion have to be from New York State. So, we can, we can you that. know, so now the Christmas tree folks are marketing, and now all these folks up in upstate have said in these articles they want to come down and see their tree. You know, it's this beautiful tree that was on the farm, the Wilberts farm for years, but now they're going to be making this sort of like homage to, you know, <laughs> like coming down to New York, this pilgrimage to New York this, this winter to go to Lincoln Square. So. Just a small example of how working together has benefited. And when you read this article about this tree grower, uh, you get teary because they're like, we have lost market share. You know, we've, we've seen people go out of business and, you know, the economy in upstate. And this one little tree is giving them so it's much hope. Joke. And now Gracie Mansion's getting in on the act. And who knows, maybe next year Rockefeller Center will have a New York State tree and you can light it. We have a we have a we have a footnote a footnote to the tree story. Pat Hooker left, as you pointed out. But yes, he's gone. Yes, he had another but, meeting. Uh, that's okay. But um, we work very closely on a lot of the initiatives related to food and beverage and mm -hmm. you know wine and spirits and cider tourism uh, with the team of Ag and Markets and in particular and Linda La Violette who yeah, works here at ESD and you know Linda. So Linda, just to put a finer point on this really good story, uh, Linda has been working with a, a really incredible entrepreneur in East Harlem who has an unbelievable, it's this urban garden center. It's underneath, it's several blocks long, underneath the elevated Metro North trains, right near La Marqueta. So it's like 117th, 118th Street, underneath that, the, the, the trains. And he too, for he sells all sorts of gardening and landscaping things, Demetrius. And he, too, was selling trees from out of state until this year, right, and so this is when, when Linda got to him and has connected him with New York State growers of Christmas. So for the first time, 
at least in recent memory, East Harlem residents, when they go to buy their Christmas trees at, at the Urban Garden Center from Demetrius, will be able to will be buying exclusively New York State trees. So anyone here, or anyone for that matter, who's going to get a tree, you can go and get a New York tree in East Harlem. As of thanks to Linda's good work, and again coordinating with Pat. But on a, on a more serious note, it's a reminder, um, Christine, that when and largely thanks to the tax input, and actually prior to your arrival and you know being appointed by the governor uh, to this position, when we started talking to the governor in the beginning of his term about tourism, he divided the work, Ross will remember this, uh, into four areas. Um, this agritourism that Pat was talking about that's played out in Taste New York and all those initiatives. Um, historic tourism, historic sites, like all the Path Through History initiatives that we have been working on. Um, certainly special events, which we've, right, another one of these areas. And then recreation uh, and outdoor activities. And sort of looking at these four different themes, and then Gavin remembers the story because he kind of came on board to make all this, bring all this to life. But then the rest of everything are the strategies and tactics to promote those themes, leverage those themes, especially their uniquely, their unique New York characteristics uh, for uh, promoting tourism and driving economic development, obviously investment in jobs and economic development from all that. And Gavin actually pointed out to me this morning that we used to say through most of 2013 and almost all of 2014 that tourism was the fifth largest employer in the state. And Gavin has corrected me, and we'll have to talk about this at a hearing, uh, upcoming committee hearing, but it's now the fourth tourism broadly described in all the subsectors of tourism is the fourth largest employer uh, in the state now, right, Gavin? That's right. One out of one. Yeah. Yay. Yay. We need to be third, though, to get bronze, right? <laughs> That's true. That's great. I don't know who you... What do we knock out? No, we don't want to... Yeah, 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 yeah. we got to be careful about that. I would also like to add that for public relations, we have a specific initiative that we go and reach out to specific publications to target communities and all of So whether it's the Chinese-American market, the uh, Latino market, we really do try and target and tailor some of our stories to each of those markets and invite them along on press trips. So mm -hmm. there is definitely an initiative to make sure that we're reaching those communities. Okay. Any other questions before we hand it over to Gavin to give your report? All right. Number four, go ahead. All right. So good morning, everybody. <laughs> and great, great to see you. Uh, Dean, nice to see you. Uh, class of 86, so it's health school, but talk to the phone first time I've met you. So um, really, uh, really just want to kind of hit two main areas uh, Christine has asked me to update you on, and that is the world travel market that we just participated in London, as well as uh, what's happening with the CFA in the current round, which is round four. <clears throat> so in your packet, you will see a, a couple of documents related to world travel mart in 2014, but let me underscore by saying to you, first of all, Ken Wong's not here because he had a baby. Okay. Wong at home and, and his, his wife, Christine, so... We all shared in that, and in fact, we did a party for him, I think, three days or something before the baby came. Yeah. He was working the day that the baby came. It was a Sunday. Yeah, he's at an event, actually. Right, he's at an event, of course. <laughs> that was very much part of the course for Ken. But anyway, um, just to contextualize why it's so important that the governor and the tech and, and commissioner have supported this international marketing effort, when you look at international marketing and tourism itself, it represents 20% of the visitor volume to New York City and New York State and represents 70% of the spend in New York City. In terms of overall, in, in the tourism generated in New York City is 60% of the overall spend in New York State. So obviously we know New York City is so important to our overall state's well-being. And the competition for the global share of international travel, travel has probably never been higher. When you go to World Travel Mart and you walk the floor, which is extensive, I mean, Mark will probably tell you in terms of square footage and number of destinations, but, I mean, everyone is there from Oman to, in fact, Egypt and others that you would think might not be there at the moment. Um, this competition is real, and this is how the New York State product, so to speak, those things that you can do in New York State, New York State including New York City, but also all of New York State, it's how it gets discovered. It's how it gets marketed. And so for us to, to, to have a presence uh, in, this, uh, in this arena is, is essentially changing one very important thing, and that is when you came to, to, to New York State and you searched, say you're, you're overseas, you just booked your airfare, and you searched for something to do in New York State, the only thing that would return to you 
would be a New York State or New York City based product. Something in New York City. <coughs> We're changing that now. We have something like 50 products available through the UK now for non New York State attractions and activities. We've done um, amazing work on that because we've had the support and the ability to do it. And by the way, California, who was right next to us, Hawaii, Illinois, Florida, deeply committed to tourism, have uh, dedicated funding streams, and are our main competitors relative to kind of share of mind and also this you know, ability to, to attract travel uh, that's already coming through the gateway to America, which is New York City. One third of all international travel comes through New York City's airports. So more specifically, when you look at the, um, the document included on World Travel Mart, you'll see that we had uh, you know, close to 50 one-on-one -on -one appointments, meetings with New York State and these various airlines, uh, tour operators, third parties, media. Um, we're not going to pass it out because I suppose that's, it hasn't been uploaded to do so, but one particular product, we met with America as you like it last year. This now is available and being marketed in, in the U.K., for itineraries, 10 to 12 day journeys through New York State under five or six different themes. Didn't exist before we went last year. Had this meeting, caused the, the <coughs> tour operator to come here on a, on a FAM tour, familiarization tour. They went through the state, they saw what they thought would sell, and now it's being marketed and it's available for sale in, in the UK. So it's, it's really transformative work and, you know, frankly, once the product exists there, you know, once it's in market, it will become organic and it will become viable on its own. It won't go away, so to speak. And that's really the kind of the, the, the infrastructure and the architecture that Rich, you know, talked about that we're trying to lay down when it comes to, you know, the international market. So any questions on, on World Travel Mart before I move on to CFA? No? Okay. Uh, lastly, in your packet, you will see that we have a review of the program overview of Market New York. That is what we call our Consolidated Funding Application Program. In 2012-2013, there was $3 million available to market New York. The governor last year at the summit announced that there would be $10 million available. And now, uh, as a result of the summit this year, announced that there would be $12 million for market New York. Remember that market New York is the one we administer uh, really beautifully through Kelly Baccarizzo and, and Matt Watson and, and Andrew, uh, the team up there, um, <coughs> Brendan rather, not Andrew. But um, last year, there were $83 million worth of tourism-related projects funded through the CFA. So I believe the uh, commissioner will correct me, but I think 13 different agencies, 39 different funding streams, $750 million total available through the CFA, and $83 million last year was dedicated to tourism-related efforts, both bricks and mortar and you know, working capital or marketing. So this year, uh, as, uh, as the commissioner uh, made note, the awards will be given on December uh, 10th up in Albany. It's actually quite an exciting period of time. Christine sits on the SIAT, the, the assessment team that uh, reviews the projects that are being considered. There are winners in, in, in terms of the overall uh, awards that are given. Uh, and the, the various regions take this very seriously. They compete for this. It's a bottoms-up approach. And you can see that it's working. I will point out this to tell you that I think there's also some, some opportunity for us and, and uh, in, in our program to do things that are even more transformative with the tourism CFA and the ways that the regions are looking at tourism and tourism-related programs, um, you know, to, to really, you know, make it exactly what it's intended to be, and that is to take ideas and, and initiatives that are currently not um, able to find their legs on their own and give a little state support so that these things turn into, you know, a very positive overall story. So on, on this note, I'll end it with uh, one, of the, one of the CFA grantees is actually a fellow uh, Destination Marketing Organization president. Her name is uh, Kelly, and, uh, and uh, Kelly Blazowski, right, in uh, Idaho. And her, her, she and her husband realized that there were a lot of uh, beverages being made in New York State, and there weren't any barrels being made in New York State to support that industry. So she and her husband applied. They won a, re a local grant. Then they won a CFA award, and they're about to open a cooperage to build these barrels that will then be sold to the various folks that are producing uh, spirits, uh, ciders, as well as wines in New York State. So another great CFA story, uh, kind of related to agriculture. By the way, agriculture is the number one employer in New York State. So good that we're working with uh, the markets on such a basis. But uh, it's really, I mean, this program is making a difference. And as, as you travel the state and as, as I travel the state, you see these initiatives like the international uh, arrival
entrance at the Corning Museum of Glass, which, by the way, is doing a 100,000 square foot expansion that they will be doing next March, March 5th, they'll be announcing. Uh, 100,000 square foot puts them at 300,000 square feet total, I think, for the museum. And, um, you know, has the ninth most, uh, the ninth largest gift shop by revenue of all museums in the country. Think of that. I mean, there are a lot of museums in the country, including here in New York. So the, we have these great assets, as, as Kenneth <laughs> referred to, and we, we need to continue to support them. So uh, that's what the CFA is doing. We're happy that we have, at the moment, $20 million worth of projects. Uh, we, we also hope the governor will continue to support this, and, and uh, we'll have another round in round five that will uh, continue that progress. Any questions or Gavin? Yes. The twelve million, uh, what Pat was talking about earlier, that million for marketing and the additional that is that's outside. That's that. outside of yeah. this. Okay. Outside of this. Mm -hmm. uh, the result of summits, uh, beer, wine, spirits, as well as the yogurt uh, summit, and maybe even one more. There were funds that were dedicated towards directly towards the ag markets <laughs> that are being um, funded out of a different source. Okay. So these, the twelve million is only for tourism. That's right. That's all tourism, bricks and mortar, as well as working capital. Okay. And when that's announced on the 10th, can we send an update? I know that we did Absolutely. press releases every year, but let's make sure that we send the press release to the Absolutely. Tenth. Okay. So they know what has been funded. Um, Ross, I think yes. you have an update as well. I do. Uh, another initiative that has launched since we met last uh, is the I Love New York bus. Hopefully some of you have heard about it. We've talked about it at previous meetings, but it is now officially up and rolling. Um, and it is uh, the, the work in getting this going. Uh, obviously, there's been a lot of people part of this team effort, but uh, and even though I'm giving the report, I want to make sure that everyone knows that the person uh, really driving this, and yes, I worked on that pun all weekend, um, <laughs> is Rowan the bully colleague who's over there against the wall who's done incredible work. In getting this going. So you probably heard, hopefully, first heard about this uh, last winter. Uh, when the governor at the Adirondack Winter Challenge, which was this event up in Lake Placid to draw attention to New York's great sports, uh, said, we need to get people to the slopes here in New York. We have more slopes than any state in the nation. We have the largest vertical drop uh, for downhill skiers in east of the Rockies. We need to make people aware of these things, and we need to get them there. And so that's when he first started talking about a ski bus to go to New York State mountains. Well, when the Wine and Beer Summit came along that you heard Pat talk about earlier, we also realized for our amazing wineries, and there are wineries in a lot of places, but there aren't necessarily wineries on beautiful lakes or along the ocean uh, like New York has. So, again, we need to let people know about those. So let's make sure that we have a bus that's taking people to the wine trails across New York State and the other New York State beverage trails. So the bus now becomes sort of a ski and beverage bus. And then at the Tourism Summit, we realize, well, there's all kinds of great things to see. And so the governor talks about, what about these amazing events that we have only in New York State? Uh, so how about a bus to bring people there? It was at this point that the I Love New York bus became not just the ski bus or the wine bus, but the I Love New York bus, with the idea of bringing people to all the great things that New York has to see. Um, so the goal of this was to provide accessible transportation uh, along with cultivated experiences to the ski mountains, to the beverage trails, to festivals and events and itineraries, all leaving from New York City. Again, this idea of this you know, great market that's in many ways our low-hanging fruit, uh, but didn't have ways to get places. Um, the I Love New York bus could hopefully <laughs> fill that gap. Uh, bring awareness of many New York State attractions and vacations out, assets outside of New York City, and really present a solution to this made efficiency. You may remember we did uh, a gap uh, report. Is that the Albany call trying to come in? I don't oh, know. Yeah, I think we lost them. Oh. And now they're back. Are you back, Albany? Hey, we're back. Okay, sorry, sorry about, about that. that. No, that's all right. Glad you're back. Uh, so I was saying, you may have remembered at a previous uh, tag meeting, we did a, uh, an outline of a gap report looking at where the needs are for tourism. And one of the things we really talked about was transportation infrastructure. That even when we get people excited and knowledgeable about what there is here in New York, that there's too many people that say, oh, well, but how am I going to get there? Particularly true in New York City, where people don't have cars. And, and the bus was really seen as a way that could hopefully uh, provide some of those linkages. And of course, this is a new way to increase economic impact through this exciting new channel. So 
we went through the uh, RFP process, as we normally do for this sort of uh, endeavor. This wasn't actually, though, uh, an RFP to hire anybody. Uh, this was to find a uh, service provider with whom we could have basically a marketing partnership, that we could brand the bus as I Love New York, that we could market it and bring attention to it, and it could provide the service. We weren't going to go into the bus business. Somebody else was going to do that. And we also weren't going to give them money in terms of making sure that there were a certain amount of number of seats sold. This is a running business endeavor for whatever company was picked, and as I said, sort of a marketing agreement. We're very pleased that the result of that RFP process was that the Hampton Jitney was uh, selected to be the provider of this bus. They're a really great company in New York based, family-owned company with 40 years of business here in New York State, <coughs> really experienced in transportation and tour operation. They're certainly known for their trips, just taking people to and from the Hamptons, but they actually run tours and have been doing that for some time. Very reputable, great safety record, all those things that we wanted. Um, and so on October 1st, in an event just around the corner, over on 40th and between 3rd and, third and Lex, uh, we had an outdoor press conference. Uh, that Christine was a part of, Gavin, Kenneth, um, and certainly the Hatton and Jitney folks and others, uh, where we actually got to unveil the bus. That's the bus behind it that looks like a backdrop. That's actually the bus uh, that pulled up in the middle of the uh, presentation. Uh, the event itself, uh, thanks to a lot of great work from Elm Silver and others, uh, got really great notoriety. Uh, 417,000 people saw this. Um, 65 million others through different outlets, uh, WABC News, Associated Press, New York One, it got some great coverage. And so now the bus is up and running uh, and uh, already going to places uh, across New York State. This fall it was all about the beverages. Great time of year to go to the uh, beverage trails and wines, uh, wineries, breweries, distilleries, cideries. Uh, some festivals and events took place. Uh, and now it's ski time, of course. Uh, and so now the important uh, work of the ski season uh, begins. And we just announced it uh, a few weeks ago at a winter media night uh, in which we had uh, over 75 media come to New York's uh, city to hear about what was happening for the ski industry as a whole, but particularly highlighting the bus. Lisa, if we could have the next slide. Um, and so there we were able to talk about all the different ski areas that are going to be served as part of this program. There's going to be day trips to the Catskills and the Hudson Valley and multi-day trips, three-day trips uh, to the Adirondacks and the Finger Lakes. Uh, and those multi-day trips include not only just getting there, but can include lessons, can include lodging, other areas and in, in, uh, other activities in the area. So, for example, to go up to the North Country, it's also taking to the Lake George Winter Carnival, for example, as part of that trip. Um, there, there are ski trips that are available to book now, a couple of those day trips uh, on the 13th and 14th to Windham and Hunter Mountain. By December 1st, the entire ski season will be available, including those multi-day trips. Uh, and anyone that rides during the inaugural season will get a free I Love New York ear band and our travel guide and some other goodies, which Hampton Jitney tells us is really, really important. This was surprising to me. They said, when people make their decisions, which of these buses to do, what, what the guineas they get are some of the most important things. So we're very excited. So we're really hoping that this will be uh, an exciting new initiative that really provides another outlet and another opportunity to get people to experience all that New York has. One thing to bear in mind is, uh, Russ re referred to this, it's a service, it's not just one bus. And it, it, it goes well with the Hampton Jitney because they have 55 pieces of equipment currently, two of them are wrapped. But if there is demand, this is scalable, number one. Typically the demand that we're talking about is off peak for them, so this is really good for them as well. It's not summer, you know, this isn't July that we're really focusing on. We're focusing on, you know, now through the shoulder seasons and then obviously during the summer when their equipment is fully deployed, there'll be less demand or, ne or need, so to speak, for bus service. But we're hopeful that it, uh, with, with Mr. Newman's help, we'll, we'll make this thing turn into a viable, magical going concern and um, that it works out for everyone. Question, and I don't know the answer to this. Uh, this, this is great, you know, transportation. Um, how many uh, places, mountains that you just listed, have ski on, ski off, either hotels, condos? It's a good question. A number of them do, uh, more than you might might think. I'd have to refer to Sandy, and I'll get back to you and answer Tom. Like possibly like not. And I know that's right. Part of this biggest vertical drop. I'm just wondering. Just I don't know the answer. These don't for various and sundry reasons, but right. a lot of the private folks do. Uh, Dan's place does. Hunter Mountain does. You know, yeah. So I mean, they're more than you might think. The answer. Any other? I don't know actually the 
precise number, but probably, probably maybe 20 percent, 25 percent of them do. Okay. I believe Holly Valley also. Holly Valley does. Yeah, also, yeah, Holly Mountain yeah. does. Yeah. Yeah. Peak, I think, as well. Creek Peak does across the street. Yeah. yeah. But see, this is your question. Almost leads to what should folks be applying to the CFA that might be transformative <laughs> for a various region. And what should the state be thinking about? Because, you know, as you ride from Gore Mountain up the, the gondola and you're coming down, you see that there's this beautiful facility and it's kind of there around and nothing else is, is nearby. Uh, whereas if you go to Killington or, you know, these other folks that, that have developed these destination resorts. So, I mean, it really begs a broader question. Any other questions for Gavin? I'll move on. Could I just, um, yep. Ross and, and Gavin, to explore, and with Nancy possibly, because I know we have an I Love New York plane with JetBlue, mm. maybe expand this to the I Love New York Amtrak, I Love New York JetBlue again, because the bus only goes a short, I'm mean, not short distance, but it doesn't go fully upstate. So it would be nice to go back to Nancy and support <coughs> I Love New York plane with JetBlue and maybe expanding this, where it's not continual service, but packaging through either Amtrak and, and possibly wrapping one of the trains or portion of the train and again going back to your plane that you have already that's already sure. branded and that you know and explore that yeah and right. to Caribbean yeah. as well Good. Uh, Gavin how uh, or Ross how long of a contract or agreement did they it's one year so one year it's just renewable. one year yeah one year renewable uh, again there's the, the state we, we didn't give them any money to, to sign up as an operator, so to speak. Um, they they wrap the buses at their own cost. They are loading a product and, and you know performing the distribution channel services at their own cost. And our goal is really to help them to, to market it and, and have folks start to think of it. We're actually picking up on Long Island as well now. Uh, there are two locations around Long Island, so right here by Grand Central as well as two two spots on Long Island. Because the theory is, why not extend out the source and you know folks want to get upstate. So would Hampton Jitney with this product be able to go to World Travel Mart or Pow Wow to be able to start marketing this to the overseas travel operators? For operators? Absolutely, and we've so also got. You're going to really start to get yep. this in market. We also had a meeting with Viator, um, <coughs> which. Marketing partnership with Viator. Uh, for those that don't know, Viator is the number one seller of activities after lodging and airfare in the world, and handled uh, half a million folks in, in New York State last year. Uh, so we have a partnership with them. We've connected Viator to uh, the Hampton Jitney folks to see if that if that makes any sense. Okay. Um, what I'd like to do now is. Uh, I guess we have to take a vote, and I believe yeah. we have a quorum now of ten TAC members. So, uh, and this is to vote on the ability for TAC to um, have subcommittees. And in your packet, we have the three subcommittees that we have already identified, one being hospitality, infrastructure, sports and special events, three, aviation and transportation. Um, this vote will also allow us to add as we go without future votes. So um, I'd like to uh, put a motion for the vote for TAC subcommittees, and I need a TAC member. Uh -huh. Okay, second. Eleanor and second Peter Carafano. So, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No, we have a vote. <laughs> 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 this is great. I'm trying to do this. Right, we have still vacancies on tax. So, um, go back and hey, Nancy, whatever you. We did approve the minutes. Or, oh no, did we didn't approve we the minutes? Vote. Right. We did a motion. Second. Motion and second. Okay. We didn't have a quorum yet. We didn't have a quorum. So to votes. approve the minutes, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed Aye. to the minute? Who's that? That was I. That was I. That was nine. Okay, very good. Okay, so the minutes are, are included. So Nancy, thank you. See, you're making a difference already. <laughs> um, and as far as any other vacancies we have, keep in mind that um, I think two of them Two of the vacancies are in Super Silver's office, right? I he has to oh. approve. So there's one in Silver's office. There's one in the minority Reader's office for the Senate, which is um, Jeff Klein. Andrew Stewart Cousins. Oh, okay, Andrew Stewart. Okay. And I forget where the third one is. I think it's uh, Assemblymember Call's office. The, okay. Uh, Assembly Minority Leader. So we'd love to take any recommendations. Um, the governor's appointments are all yeah, booked up. So yes. okay. All right. Um, 
moving on to new business. Right? The subcommittees. Oh, the subcommittees. So now Jan. Well, actually, me it's first. You're first? Yep. All right, go ahead, Ross. <laughs> now, that we have, now that you're legitimized. That's right. Now that we officially have subcommittees, I'm happy to report, though, we didn't, we didn't want to wait for a vote to actually start at least having some right. initial discussions. Um, and so I've been working with uh, the, uh, the three chairs of the subcommittees to sort of start moving and start discussions so we can start achieving our goals. Um, there's been some scheduling issues that we're still uh, finishing up for aviation and sports, but those are moving ahead. Um, there has been a meeting already of the Hospitality uh, Infrastructure Committee uh, headed by Jan Chesterton, who is here with us today, uh, and can give us a report on what's been going on with that subcommittee. Okay. Thank you. Are we back live because we're questioning whether you can hear us or not? We can yeah. hear and see you. Okay. Thank you very much, and thank you, Russ. Um, our committee met for the first time via conference call back on the 20th of, uh, 30th of October, and we took, uh, as Ross had pointed out, we took the objectives that were outlined in that uh, outline that we just approved, and we talked a little bit and expanded on the objectives. And what we settled on was, was coming to the goal of presenting three to four initiatives or ideas, if you will, for the development of new or improvement of existing lodging infrastructures. We wanted to look at the ways investors or develops could utilize existing funds, partnerships, or incentives or support from the state in any way. Um, I think we got a lot of groundwork done on that first call because we kind of uh, weeded through what needed to be done and where we needed to go and what kind of information we needed to gather in order to come back and kind of sort this out. So we set a couple of goals uh, to identify underdeveloped inventory throughout the state and maybe try to pinpoint why it was underdeveloped, determine perhaps what were some of the barriers, where it's geographical, uh, demographics, financial. And then we also wanted to highlight some of the successes and what, what made them successful. What were some of the projects and how did they come to be a success and what were some of the partnerships that were formed to, to bring them to that point. Um, we, uh, and I want to thank uh, Dean Johnson for offering some of his resources and we, we came away from the meeting with two initial action points. Uh, the dean was going to reach out to his contacts within some of the major uh, brands, hotel brands, and talk to their, their investment and their development people. What, what are they thinking in the marketplace? What are some of the strengths of the regions around the state? What are some of the weaknesses? What are the, some of the opportunities that they're finding with going forward with developments and investments, particularly on the upstate market? And he's had some uh, very good success reaching out some of the top five or six brands and is still a, a work in progress. Um, I was also uh, charged with doing a little research um, on existing pipeline. What's in the pipeline so far in New York State, obviously focusing a little bit more on the upstate. Um, and what I had hoped to do is kind of drill down by market segment and region. Um, I did come up with market segment and I, and I will distribute to the subcommittee at the next meeting. I wasn't able to, to define it by region as much as by market. But I think that's all good research that we've started. I think it's something that we can come back together on uh, at our next committee meeting and talk about, you know, flushing out some of these initiatives of how there could be some partnerships, what are the resources available, and identify hopefully through these um, some of these things that fact-finding that we have, identify some regions that really have some viable uh, opportunities and also learn from some of the stuff that's been, that's been done already. And we talked a little bit and um, quite a bit, we talked about the, uh, the success of the public-private partnership uh, process, too many Ps, in uh, Auburn and the hotel development down there. So got a lot of moving parts. We're just, um, just starting our research and we hope to come back uh, hopefully the end of November, if not the first part of December, for a second meeting and, and take a look at what we found. So it's a work in progress, and I want to thank uh, Ross and Lisa for the help and certainly Dean Johnson for doing the research thus far. So that would be an update. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Jan. Um, Dean Johnson or Tom, also on the committee, is there anything you'd like to add? No, I thought it was a good, uh, it was a good start, really, to identify this and, and really spur owners to... to Build something. I hate to say build it down top, but you know certain areas that works. Dan, you're no. on the committee. Same. Dean. <coughs> well, we're still process stage. So I'm going to summarize. I've done about five out of six interviews. We're talking to four of the major brands uh, and two of the major developers uh, that 
domestically in the United States, so we're trying to get a sense of what the more national developers, how they look at the state as opposed to how regional or local developers look at the state. What was their reaction when you approached them? Uh, well, all of them are members of my advisory board, okay, so they so were more than, than, more than willing to help out. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, I think just the fact that, you know, New York State tourism, you know, is reaching out to these major developers, I, I hope would send a strong message that we're serious about um, hotel the, development. There's two, I mean, you have the developers and you have the brands. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the brands don't really invest in their own hotels. They're the, basically the reservation backbone mm -hmm. sign a contract with them. So having a Marriott, Hilton, Hyatt, what have you, come in and, and build and operate and own a hotel doesn't exist, really. They don't do that. They, you will have an individual investor, owner, with Peace Line to build a hotel, and they would select one of those brands. If you marry a you know, high-end Ritz-Carlton down to, you know, something less, to a courtyard or Hilton at a Waldorf Story, what have you, but they really don't put, they'll put maybe some small amount of money in just to buy the contract. So that's really, it's a, you know, I wish we could all wave a magic wand and have Marriott or Starwood and someone like that come in and say, I'm going to invest $80 million or $100 million in buildings. They can be helpful on certain things because it's easier to get financing if you have a major brand reserva as a reservation system and they're partners with you, mm -hmm. uh, it partners with their, their contract. Um, so it's really spurring the owners of these hotels, the land and owners, to do it and then pick the right brand for that right location and within that brand, high, low, middle, what have you. Mm -hmm. So that, that's really... You know, if we can get a special deal with one of these Michael Newton adults, you know, a Hilton or a, or a um, Starwood or, or whoever to actually sponsor something and be part of it would be great. Uh, but traditionally, that's, they don't put a lot of their money in. Mm -hmm. They have some definite views. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think we want to, as a subcommittee, sort of explore them first before we mm -hmm. think about some of the solutions are. I mean, I, I keep recalling, and I know George is here, so it's it's flagging my memory. But you know, back in the day, it was the hotel, like you know, a Bill Marriott who said, "I'm going to put, I'm going to put a flag on the ground here, you know, in Times Square," and then they put the money behind it. I don't know if they hired, you know, other developers and whatnot, but they were they seemed to be. That's and also, the last 15 ESG years. was also uh, they own the, the land, and ESG gave them land, so. Until recently, they then bought the land out. So it was a state partnership with Marriott at that. If well, I'm Marriott correct. does own the marquee. That's one of their old. Yeah. Flag. That's way back. I don't know how many years in the 70s. I think that mm -hmm. was one of their flagships. I think they still own that. But nowadays, yeah. uh, they've split off into the REITs owning the, the brands versus mm -hmm. the uh, hotels themselves. So it's really you're buying a marketing firm, and they, they really put money in. Mm -hmm. But it is a partnership, is because you want a, a <coughs> reservation system. I do like the idea that the, the Dean Johnson has, has, because when you take the temperature of the brands who right. then interact with the development community, I remember having a conversation prior to, to coming on board here with Hilton about Glens Falls and you know the, the idea of having a hotel connected to the convention center there, which is currently underutilized and is a, you know, is an albatross around their next, relatively speaking, to the tax <coughs> equation, and you know, it almost got dismissed out of hand. Despite the fact that there is an opportunity there, you know it may not be, you know it may not be a marquee opportunity for them. But uh, I, I really like this idea of taking the temperature and getting the brand's take on the potentials and, the, and what because they do then tell. I mean, you've known this. I, I worked with developers and, and go to the brand. and They would dissuade or they'd give their take on on the market, and that in many cases determine what happened. Yeah, you, you're right, Kevin. In, in Two, well, three different locations, what happened is we were trying to get a Ritz Carlton, what have you. What they do is they'll come in there and they'll do their standard, press a button, get right. Smith research and get the, get the stats. But since there is really no stat for the, uh, anything above really a select surf, uh, hotel, it, the comps are tough for them to justify, wow, I'm going to do this and think I can charge four or five, six hundred dollars a night when there is no comp. My, my guess is there's plenty of locations where that can be justified. It's just you're looking at the first one in and it's, there's no comps there. It's a risk, and a lot of the uh, capital doesn't want to follow that risk. No, and the brands will say the same. We just don't have comps. We think you'll do $600 a night, but we just don't have any way to back that up. So, But as one or two get going, it, it'll, you know, I think it'll prove the market out. It can you know, work. Mm -hmm. well, <coughs> weigh in on, on any of this? Uh, yes, it, it is true that um, most of the time, the ownership, uh, they are the ones that actually put in the funding. However, um, like Marriott, for instance, right now, <coughs> almost 22 hotels in the city. And it's because uh, sometimes 
we go out, look for location, and then we go to, let's say, um, Harry Rose, who owns uh, some of the uh, courtyards in the city, and say, look, we think this location is going to be ideal for this brand. Are you interested? You know, so in fact, last Monday, Mr. Merritt was in town scouting you know, places just to see if we can have any extra. Yeah, yes, yeah. I agree. In, in Manhattan, it's a unique. Manhattan's a yeah. whole microcosm. I mean, for hotel industry, it's, you can't look at Manhattan as being the rest of the world or the state because Bill Marriott's not going up to upstate New York looking for a location. They're dying to get in Manhattan because it's you know ninety percent or whatever the numbers are occupancy rates. It's the top hotel market in the world. It's unique. So generally, in Manhattan, you're one hundred percent right. But outside, which is I think where we're focused, is that yeah. they don't do that. Now, well, next time he's in town, introduce him to Michael or to any <laughs> member of He can come here to TAC. We'd love to hear from him, and maybe he could be enticed. You know, I was given a tour in Lake Placid during the governor's uh, Adirondack Challenge. Ross and I went together, right? Or, mm -hmm. Yeah, and we were, we were shown the five-star uh, new hotel mm -hmm. properties in the Lake Placid area, mm -hmm. which were very impressive, but they weren't tied to a key flagship. So... I had well, yeah, never yeah. heard of them before. And Which then ones were they? Whiteface. Whiteface Lodge. And, uh, the Lodge, Lake Placid Lodge. Lodge. Yeah. And then they're using leading, leading hotels Leading of the hotels world. of the world. That's a brand, that's a, brand, that's a reservation yeah. system. And then you have, they're looking at Autograph. A lot of these big right. brands like yes. Marriott or Hilton have sort of, if there's a good boutique in that area yep. and they don't want to change the name to Marriott, they'll keep it as mm -hmm. the Whiteface Lodge. They'll there's say it's a canopy coming to New York. What's that? The new Hilton lifestyle brand canopy. Is coming well, there's, there's a couple. There's, there's, there's a, like Marriott has what's called um, autograph brand. Yeah. So you'll see you know, Christine Schrager Hotel, that, the, right? you know, an autograph collection by yeah. Marriott, and that's you're basically using a Marriott reservation system. But you get to keep the Christine name because it's been there 50 years or what have you, and they don't want to change that name, and it's a reservation system. Not 50 uh, Hilton years. Hilton just <laughs> Hilton, <laughs> Hilton uh, just launched Curio, which is their version of of, of autograph. It's just the backbone reservation using Marriott Hilton and Star what have you. Well, I appreciate the work that you're doing already, uh, Jan and and committee. If there is a way to once you come up with more of your research. If there's any way that we can pull together maybe a fam tour for hotel developers or hotel brands. You know, we did something similar when we were trying to expand the Javits Center and um, the leadership at the time, you know, John Tisch, and, you know, he lent us his plane. I don't know what the rules are, but maybe we've got JetBlue, we have Delta, we have United, we, you know, if we could do a day trip and maybe take a tour of what's available, maybe we can entice them to come. And I think if they just... If they feel sort of the interest from, you know, the New York State brand, I think it might give them, look, the bottom line is it's going to be a numbers, you know, play. Yeah. If it, it's going to be on paper, and if it works for them, they're going to do it. If it doesn't, they won't. But if I think if they feel compelled, at least we'll get them up there to see I it. I think it's a great idea. I think so. the, the one microcosm of a, of a trip like that, we have to be focused on something above a select serve hotel. Because yeah. there is Garden Inn, Hilton Garden Inn, so there's, right. there's courtyards well, everywhere, and they'll, they'll, fan, they'll be part of that. It's will they go the next notch, bring up right. the next level? Uh, and if we can do a fan tour based around the next level, do a four or five yeah. around the state, that I think is, is I great mean, if idea. Jim McKenna from Lake Placid wants to give the tour that he gave us, um, you know, and then it was also teamed with the governor doing the Adirondack Challenge, so there were all of these sort of VIP feeling, you know, you sure. go to this event with the governor, you're skiing, you're this, you're, you know. It's if we can idea. pull in some of those CEOs or, <coughs> uh, you know, CFOs on maybe one of these next Adirondack Challenges, maybe it puts a whole new emphasis yeah. on um, how serious we are about this yeah. issue. We've talked about it a lot, now we have to really yeah. push That's it. That's a great so, idea. Okay. Terrific. Um, the other committees, you're going to keep us posted on? Yes, I'm working meet. with the chairs and, uh, and the rest of the committees to get those schedules going, and so there'll be first meetings very soon. Terrific. Thanks, Ross. Mm -hmm. And I understand we have a special guest from the newly formed New York State Tourism Industry Coalition called Nice Tia. Is that how we're pronouncing it? Yep. Nice okay. Tia. Jill Delaney, you are in Albany. Jill, welcome, and we look Thank forward you. to working with you. Which one is Jill? That's me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Jill right. so actually attended our staff meeting last week in Albany, and then we also uh, had time to, to speak with her board uh, a couple weeks back when they did a conference in Poughkeepsie. So we're off to a great start, and, and we really look forward to working with them. Terrific. 
All right, congratulations. If there is no new business, I'm going to adjourn. But Assemblywoman, would you like to? No, I thought anything? it was a great meeting. And thank you. I uh, really enjoyed being here. Well, thank you for your, your hard work, and we look forward to seeing you up in Albany. For, uh, I have a few meetings that I'm supposed to. Uh, okay, so our next meeting will be Monday, January 26th, here, 11 a.m. to 1, uh, then Monday, March 23rd. Um, May, 20, tw May of 2015, we're going to be doing the Tourism Summit again, so we will be plan we're planning on it, so that will be in Albany, so we'll get back to you on the date, and then after the summer, back in September, we'll be here in New York, and then um, in November. So those all those things. And everyone's full there, so you yeah. mark your calendar yeah. the whole year ahead of time. Right. Finally, right? I mean, yeah. there you go. <laughs> Is there going to be a winter Adirondack challenge this year? We're hopeful, right? We'll know from the governor. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, as soon as we know, you'll know. <laughs> or, or maybe I'll know when Very you know. Nice. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, and uh, we hope you all have a terrific holiday season. Go get thank those you. New York State holiday trees, <laughs> um, and we'll see you next year, if not sooner. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.